so good evening everyone uh, i can see lots of people are slowly joining us which is fantastic uh, my name's pete haskell i'm the trust's head of communications and engagement and i'd like to say welcome to this evening's event um, which is all about integrated catchment management and the work of the tweed forum uh, so thanks very much for joining we're expecting around about 280 to 300 people um, so we'll wait a little while just to let the numbers clock up a little bit more. Um, special thanks to the Central Borders local group for organising this talk. Um, and I'll be handing over to Alison Smith shortly, who's the chair of that local group. Um, just as a reminder, we are going to be recording tonight's event and the recording will be going up on our website. Um, we've got a, a growing collection of our online talks on the website. And this evening we'll be using the, the Q&A and the chat functions. Um, so any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and the, the chat can be used for anything that's not a question, um, but please don't put any web links into the chat or the Q&A. Okay, so I can see that numbers are still slowly going up. We're at about 150, so we'll just give another few seconds and then I'll pass over. Okay, Alison, I think I'll pass over to you if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine, Pete, thank you. No problem. Okay. Right, well, a uh, very warm welcome to everyone tonight from the Central Borders Group. Um, we're located in the south of Scotland between the Berwickshire Group and the Dumfries and Galloway Group, uh, with a variety of habitats over our patch, including the River Tweed and some of its tributaries, which is in fact the subject of tonight's presentation. Within the Central Borders Group, we have and have had over many years, in fact, since the 1960s, uh, a mix of backgrounds, knowledge levels, uh, skill sets, interests, and indeed specialisms. We have several Scottish Wildlife Trust reserves located on our patch, Beamerside near St Boswells, Whitlaw Wood at Hoyk, Hare and Dunhog Mosses just south of Selkirk, and heading over towards the Berwickshire Group, we have Din Moss and Hoslaw Loch near Kelso, and Gordon Moss, which, surprise, surprise, is near Gordon. Our normal winter talks are well attended, as are our, our normal summer walks, but of course, you know, like most things, they, they've been temporarily suspended at the moment. Uh, we have been experimenting with short local group Zoom presentations and are planning to do more of these. Uh, on the physical skills side of things, uh, we provide work party assistance when required to back up the more heavy work undertaken by the Scottish Wildlife Trust Dalkeith team. These more physical tasks range from formation of glades at Gordon Moss on the old railway line, the installation of damming piles at Din Moss, and the clearing of young tree growth from clearings on wet moss areas, uh, right through to carrying out a regular litter pick uh, on the verge of the A7, uh, which is adjacent to the Hare Moss Reserve. Uh, on the educa educational front, our members undertake presentations to local groups and we attend events when, re when requested. We would certainly like to do more work with children than we currently do, and we're certainly a bit short on watch groups in our area at the moment. Publications-wise, uh, a hard-working team in our group updated the Eildon Hills booklet in 2016, which I think I can show you in front of me there. Uh, and that it was first published in 1976 with various uh, subsequent updates. And this was selling well in the local bookshops, uh, which is good for our funds, uh, prior, of course, to the lockdowns. Central Borders Group has a Facebook page that we feel allows us to reach out to members and indeed non-members who are interested in the wildlife on our patch, as well as highlighting the bigger national issues. It certainly was very good uh, during the lockdown to be able to communicate what people were seeing. 
Other skills of a more administrative nature within the group are deployed in reviewing planning applications and representing the Scottish Wildlife Trust and Central Borders Group on local steering groups and forums, uh, such as the Environmental Alliance and the New South Scotland Enterprise, a local biodiversity site steering group, site steering group, and indeed the Tweed Forum. We are currently looking at linking up with the Tweed Forum uh, with the, on, on the basis of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Uh, the, the, the relatively new Riverwoods project, which is, I think it's really good to have connection in these things. So Tweed Forum it leads me nicely on uh, to introduce a presentation tonight uh, that is to be given by Derek Robson, who is the Senior Conservation Officer at the Tweed Forum. His talk is entitled Integrated Catchment Management and Work of the Tweed Forum. So I'll hand over, I should just say, we have had a wee technical issue, so you probably won't be able to see Derek, uh, and the slides are going to be moved on through headquarters. So apologies that you probably would like to see Derek rather than me, but you're not going to be able to see his face at the moment. Okay, over to you, Derek. Thank you, Alison. I think not being able to see me is probably a bonus, but uh, I do apologise that uh, we'll be using the PDS, but I'm hopefully it'll work. It'll work fine. So. Thank you very much, Alison, for, for introducing me there. And uh, it's great to be able to speak to you uh, about the, the work of the Tweed Forum. It's a real honour and privilege to be with you tonight with like-minded people. So uh, yeah, straight into the work that we do. Um, delivering integrated cash and management is what a uh, Tweed Forum does. And it's a wonderful uh, place to live and work, the Tweed Cash, absolutely fantastic. Next slide, Pete, please. So, to talk tonight, just like to say a little bit about who we are and what we do, uh, where we work, a little bit about some of our key projects and some quite big projects on the go, some of our woodland projects, um, our river restoration projects, peatland restoration, our invasive non native species program. Um, look at some of the other smaller projects we do, we've got quite a number of the smaller ones. Uh, also, if we've got time, discuss some of the challenges in delivering these projects and also some of the opportunities that are available to us going forward and some of the projects that we really need to be carrying forward at a landscape scale to address the biodiversity and climate change challenges that we have. Next slide, Pete, please. This is the team. Uh, there are nine of us uh, full time at the moment, two part time and two will be joining us fairly soon. So that is tremendous uh, that we're expanding that way. We're governed by a board of trustees. Um, who look after the day-to-day -day work that we do. And we're, we're involved with about 25 other partner organisations who we work closely with uh, on, a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So it's a really strong knit team and we work really well. So it's fantastic. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. We work in partnership, as I mentioned, and we have lots and lots of partners. I'll not list them all there. You can see them, but some of the key ones from the government side are SEPA, uh, Scottish Forestry, Scottish Government, Nature Scott, Environment Agency, and Natural England. We work with the uh, local authorities, both north and south of the border, Northumberland County Council, Scottish Borders Council, and lots and lots of charitable trusts as well. So it's a really close-knit family. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. And that's our, our office there, that's the Tweed catchment. It's um, it's like a horseshoe really, it's facing to the, the coast, horseshoe of hills around the north, the west, and the south side with the basin in the middle heading out towards the sea. It's an unusual catchment, it's cross border. So about 15% of it's actually in, in England and Northumberland and about 85% of it's in Scotland. Uh, but a lovely part of the world. Next slide, Pete, please. Some of the land use types, well, if you're, Imagine an airplane coming off the sea at Berwick and the first thing you, you, well, you won't hit them, hopefully, but you'll fly over them are the, are the sea cliffs on the Berwickshire coast. And they are really tremendous looking up the coast from St. Abbs. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, and then you come up the, through the Berwickshire Merse, which is really intensively arable. Uh, mixed livestock and arable. Come up in the middle of the catchment, you get a lot of um, pasture land, sheep, cattle, uh, arable as well. And right up to the top of the catchment, it's mostly pasture uh, with some coniferous shelter belts. Next slide, Pete, please. And further up towards the head of the catchment, lots and lots of uh, pasture land. And in the extreme west of the, of the area, uh, lots of commercial conifer woodland. As you can see in that image on the top right, we'd like to see more uh, of the sort of bottom left image, if you like, that sort of mixed um, coniferous woodland, native woodland, uh, productive broadleaves even, mixed in with uh, farmland and, and uh, conservation as well. So just to get a more integrated landscape going in these upland areas, really fantastic. There's lots of heather moorland too, and wind farms, we have quite a number of them. 
Next slide, Pete, please. The drivers for us, are the drivers for, for everyone involved in, in conservation at the minute, the biodiversity loss is really a biodiversity crisis, as the government has said. Carbon capture is really important to, to us all and, and how we adapt to climate change, because it, it's definitely here. Um, soil conservation is big for us, water quality is big. NFM, Native Woodland Expansion, our ENS program is really big. Uh, but of course, food production, timber production, very, very important, mainstays of the borders economy. And sustaining these rural communities is really, really important too. And sustainable tourism going forward, that's going to be a big opportunity for us, we think. So that's really quite an important feature. It's going to be developed more so as time goes on. Next slide, Pete, please. So if you look at our first project, um, Native and Rye Woodland uh, Planting Programme, that's that's uh, been largely driven or um, orchestrated by Hugh, one of our colleagues at Tweed Forum, Hugh Chalmers. He's done a lot of work on woodland planting. We try and use the existing forestry grant schemes that are there, but often there's a shortfall. Uh, between the, the grants that we receive or the farmers receive and the cost of actually doing the work. So here's a woodland planting here, right here in woodland planting. We're trying to use as much um, open ground as possible. We're allowed up to 15% open ground, so we utilise that. 20% shrubs, where we can do that as well. So you get these really, really lovely and well-designed woodlands, hopefully. We work a lot with Scottish Borders Council. We use wind farm mitigation funds. They've been very helpful in getting, getting us some money to do that, which has really been very helpful to deliver these on the ground. We work with Scottish Government and work with private funders as well, like Forest Carbon, who can help top up some of the costs of these things, which is really very, very, very helpful. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. We've planted over 650 hectares of native woodlands over recent years, over a million trees now. The drivers have been, as I mentioned, to try and slow the flow of flood water down because the you know, winters are getting wetter. Um, we're getting more intensive rainfall events when they do come. But on the back of, of the driver, which is NFM, you do get all these other benefits that we know about in you know, habitat connectivity, um, wildlife conservation, diffuse pollution control, soil quality enhancement carbon storage and landscaping landscape appeal just making it more and more diverse so there's lots and lots of benefits beyond the driver the main driver there next slide Pete, please we've done a lot of mapping a lot of mapping over the years mapping the resources that we have and opportunities for developing these resources and this map shows basically the catchments the subcatchments above, above the towns that flood so you've got gala shields there peebles selkirk and down the southwest hoik and there's a lot of work going on within these catchments to try and help that uh, water slow down and we do a lot of that with woodland planting. Next slide Pete please. This is just a wee graphic um, of the landscape above Hoik. This is upstream of Hoik so that's the upper Tebet catchment and that's uh, about 80 hectares of native riparian woodland that's been planted over the last two to three years in the upper TV at catchment, working with farmers, working together at the catchment scale. And it, they are small, admittedly, and they're two to three hectares, some of them, and maybe up to 10, 15 hectares, some of the bigger ones. But in a landscape where there's not much riparian woodland, this makes a huge difference. You can see the conifer blocks along the top of the, of the ridges there, but down in the main stem of the valley, it's mostly pasture land um, with riparian woodland, and there'll be more of that as, as time goes on. Hopefully that will help with, with flooding down, downstream. Next slide, Pete, please. Here's just an example of one of the, these upper TV woodlands. This is about five hectares, so again, not, not terribly big. Um, lots and lots of plastic shelters in that image. We've kind of moved off uh, plastic tree shelters. We're trying to do more with deer fencing and, uh, and uh, volgards. And we're actually, my colleagues actually experiment with, with not using any type of fencing and just trying to control the deer and see how we get on with that approach. But the plastic's definitely uh, losing its appeal, thankfully. But uh, more and more deer fencing will be used. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. And here we can see how these habitats network together. So you've got this ribbon of, of riparian woodland going down through this cluck in front of us, across the water course in the floodplain, across on the other side, up around that scar and away up that hill dike. So the woodland's kind of connecting all the way through there. And that's what we're trying to do with these sites, just trying to connect the habitats together and create these corridors for wildlife in the landscape where there isn't much woodland, frankly. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. Here's an image from uh, 2012 on the left and another image from 2020. This is Nagala water above Stow, uh, this is the Crookston farm. So obviously the one on the left shows it just after planting, one on the right shows it eight years later. So yeah, it's slow to come, it's coming, it's definitely there. Uh, there's maybe, maybe more gaps than we'd like, but it's, the trees are definitely coming and that'll just 
you know, develop as time goes on as a nice native woodland. Next slide, Pete, please. And it's another one, it's my colleague Hugh's done, another one uh, down in 2012, on the left in 2020. On the right, that's looking really good. Um, a good mix, probably about, there'll be at least 10 native species of trees in there, uh, at least. So a good diverse mix to deal with climate change as we go forward. Next slide, please. And some of the challenges of this one, well, I mean, they're quite, quite, um, you know, not, not huge, but project facilitation is definitely key. We've got to keep these projects um, facilitated and keep people working with the farmers in these catchments. That's absolutely fundamental. Finding a shortfall is really important. Shortfall between the grants and the and the actual cost of doing the work. But we've got various uh, income streams that we can draw down, particularly forest carbon and the SBC facility wind farm funds. So they are really, really helpful. Um, it'd be good if we're creating these forest ecosystems to try and put more habitat into the forest itself, like ponds and wetlands and leaky barriers and water troughs. So if the Scottish forestry were able to part fund or at least fund some of these, it'd be really, really helpful to get these ecosystems up and running. Next slide, please. And apart from, you know, natural flood management, river temperatures are really, really important too. Um, river temperatures are increasing. Uh, Tree Foundation have been monitoring some of these and the river temperatures are increasing. So you can see from that graphic there that the yellow areas are where the river temperatures are increasing. And a lot of it's down through the Cheviot Hills uh, and the southern part of the catchment. And also in the, the lower Tweed catchment, there you can see 24, 25 degrees have been recorded in these, in these rivers. So, you know, when it gets up to 30 degrees, then it does cause fish uh, some problems. So the River Woods project will be fundamental in trying to help shade the rivers for the fish and try and keep the temperatures down within these river systems, particularly for the fish. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. So we've mapped quite a lot. So this is an example of, of one of the opportunity maps, if you like, this is an opportunity for, for um, arable farming. These are all the fields. So you can see right away where our arable fields are in the catchment. The darker the fields, the, the better the crop, if you like. So that could be the winter wheat in, in the dark brown there. So we've done that for most of the things like biodiversity, forests, um, arable landscapes. Next slide, Pete, please. And we've done an opportunity mapping for natural flood management. This is really quite a good one. We, we do use this map a lot. Um, the green areas, for example, just an overview of the borders, it shows you where you could plant trees to try and slow the flow water down in these green areas. The brown areas where you could block hill drains and peat bogs to try and make the peat bogs wetter and, and retain some of the water there and store some of the carbon. The light blue areas are down the floodplain where you could store water again to try and slow the flow down. And the yellow areas, that squeeze middle between the, the in-by and upland landscapes, that's where you could maybe do something to increase the water infiltration down into the grass paddocks if you like. Maybe rather than not just using ryegrass, but deep rooted plants to try and take the water down rather than it running off across the surface. So we've got lots and lots of map data we can fall back on. Next slide, please, Pete. Um, yeah, another project, another big project for us is the Natural Flood Management Programme. And um, we've got a big demonstration catchment in Edelson Water. And really what we're trying to do there is, is, is reduce or take this flashy spatey river, if you like, and, and flatten the curve. To, to, through natural flood management process, you try and slow that flow of water down through the NFM curve there and try and reduce the, the height on the, on the yellow curve there. And there's lots of things we can do uh, through that process. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the Edelson Water Catchment. This is a, a big demonstration catchment for us. It's a project in partnership with Scottish Government, SEPA, uh, Interreg Dundee University, uh, particularly led to uh, Chris Spray who's uh, one of our trustees, and Hugh as well. So there's lots and lots happened in this particular catchment over recent years. We've planted over 207 hectares of woodland. Lots and lots of stock fencing, deer fencing gone in. Uh, they've restored nearly three kilometres of our river from a canalised state to re Meander Strait, and they've put in 116 water flow restrictors. These are like little beaver dams, if you like, but uh, with lots of uh, flow underneath, but they do kick in at flood levels to push the water off the floodplain. So absolutely tremendous. And in that process of doing that, the water status has gone from bad through poor to moderate. So it's helping naturalize the river, which is fantastic news. Pete, next slide, please. And there's lots of lots of uh, drivers for this particular project. Um, Chris and others have been looking closely at how they can reduce flood risk. 
uh, how they can improve the habitats on these rivers, what techniques would work best to slow the flow down, uh, what other uh, benefits are, are delivered alongside the NFM, what are the costs, you know, how do farmers react to this kind of thing, and are they, are they enthusiastic, are, are they otherwise? Next slide, please. And lots and lots of monitoring, lots of monitoring going on in this particular valley. They're monitoring rainfall, uh, water flow levels, water flow rates, groundwater, uh, the morphology of the river, the ecology of the river, and its um, acceptability to the farmers. That's really important that these work in tandem with the farming business. They absolutely have to work as part of the farming business. That's really fundamental to keep the farmers on board and get them to, to move forward with this approach. Next slide, please. Here's an example of uh, an aerial image of that particular catchment that just near that's Kringle to the hotel on the left, and that knows it, the road that runs up from Peebles to Edinburgh on in the centre of the picture there, and you've got the canalised water course going up the old railway line. So that's what it was like before they started restoring the river. Next slide, please. And that's it just uh, not long after restoration. You can see the road going up on the right-hand side there. The railway going up through the, the old railway going up through the centre. The canalised river used to go up past that railway line alongside it, but they've pushed it right over onto the, as far as they can go across the floodplain and put the re meanders back. So that just reconnects the river with its floodplain. That's tremendous. And that looks going to look really good as time goes on. Next slide, please. And it was quite a task, um, but the contractors were absolutely fantastic. These that they're doing here is putting root wads in on the bend of the of the channelized course. These are just sick as spruce trees cut into about 15 foot lengths with the roots exposed to the river bank and then turf put on top. And that pushes the river across into its channel and right across the floodplain. But they're quite skilled, these contractors. They really know what they're doing. It's fundamentally important to get contractors that do know what they're doing, but these are actually top class, these people. So it's absolutely tremendous. Uh, next slide, please. And this is it in 2013. This is the, the new channel going in. Um, yeah, next slide, please. That's just not long after starting. And we'll see a vision just about a year after, I think. Yeah, not long after 2014. You start to see these riffles and glides and pools. In nature is starting to kick in really, really quickly, and nature starts to recover and come back. So it's it's all good news. And these have been heavily monitored three times, so it's all working really well. Next slide, Pete, please. On that particular site, there was a, a, a conifer plantation of Sitka, and that was uh, the farm was quite happy for that to be felled and, and replanted. This is what it looked like before the felling. Next slide. Pete, please. And that's it after. So you can see the root boards went then down at the bottom left hand side of the picture where the, the canalised channel used to run, pushed across into the new channel, maximising the, the use of the floodplain. There were retention ponds at the top and then a whole suite of broadleaf trees planted uh, on the floodplain air. Next slide, please. And you can see the purpose is, is in this picture, really, that it does hold the water in big uh, flood events. You can see that storing the water there and releasing it slowly through time. And you can see, you see this band on the left-hand side of the picture. It's quite important to work with farmers to try and accommodate them as much as possible. So the field to the extreme left of the picture, that was one of his best silage fields. So it's important to keep the, the flood water off that. So it was um, try to be kept within the curb arm that we hoped it would be kept in. So that's, that's really worked really well. Uh, you can see there, uh, working very well. Next slide, Pete. And another view looking another way. That's the same compartment on the right hand side of the picture. And and uh, Hughes negotiated with the landowner on the left of the old railway line to break through there and then continue right the way down the valley. And you can see how that will naturalise very, very quickly in time. So obviously it was an issue uh, up against the public road here, here to, to keep the river from undermining the road. That was uh, heavily engineered in that particular part, but that's absolutely fundamental to stop undermining the road. But we're confident there's enough floodplain there for the river to expand onto the floodplain and not cause the road any damage whatsoever. Next slide, please, Pete. And that's what it looks like at the lower end. So it's all looking very natural and very, very good. And that'll just improve uh, for wildlife as time goes on. Next, please. Water retention ponds, I mean, they're really, really popular. Ponds are always popular, but these are, uh, there's seven images. There's four towards the top of the image, just below the farm there, and three obviously in the foreground. So there's seven there. 
water retention ponds do store the water. They draw down in dry weather. They'll, they'll fill up in, in wet weather. And in between times will be absolutely fantastic for all manner of wildlife. So it's great to get more and more wetlands into the borders landscape. Uh, next, Pete. Yeah, oh, there we go. And look at barriers. Well, yeah, now these are very, very, they're, they're not high high spec, as you can see. They're just basically tops of Sitka spruce uh, felled, uh, dropped over the river, pegged in with with um, posts uh, and some freeboard underneath. And when the river comes up, the picture on the right shows what happens there. The river just pushes, get, gets pushed across onto the floodplain. And these are really, really effective at slowing the, the flood water down. Absolutely tremendous at slowing the flood water down. It's been proven that these will. Or, you know, slow the, the, the flood down really considerably more than you'd possibly imagine. Uh, it's quite impressive how much they will actually take the peak flow off. Next slide, Pete, please. This is a recent one that he's been working on. Um, anybody that knows it, this is Little Yarrow, just at the very top of the picture. You just see the lock of the louse there, just beginning to break the top of the slide there. That's St Mary's Lock, and you can see the, the, the canalised channel going down through the centre and the Remeander channel. Uh, cutting through the floodplain fields and then cutting back across. So that's what it looks like, uh, or as a model, if you like. And on the ground, I think the next slide will show us what's happened this winter. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. Yeah, there's the Canley section on the right, and there's the remeandered section on the left. And all that area in the foreground, in the mid foreground, will be planted with um, floodplain woodland, native broadleaf woodland. And here's St Mary's Lock, we'll lock of the lows in the distance there, you can see. So that's all re-naturalised in that landscape and it'll be taken back for wildlife. So, you know, working with the landowners there, that's going to be a really flagship project for us, we think. Next slide, please. The challenges for this are, are much the same as they are for, for Woodlands, really. It's just getting the project facilitation in place, uh, finding the shortfall funding or the funding to do this, because it can be relatively expensive uh, to do. And it's, it's overcoming, you know, take working with landowners and farmers, taking them with you um, and uh, encouraging them to do this and, 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 and looking how they develop over time and their attitude changes to this over time. But it's no doubt enough to be doing more of this with the climate change and biodiversity. Loss. This is creeping up the agenda as well, so there'll be more and more of this happening probably in, in due course. But again, they have to sit with the, the business model, they have to sit within a farm business model. One of the challenges for us is we think we have to develop more markets for these nature based services and we have to attract more private money because there's just not enough public money in the system to do all the kind of work that needs to be done. So we need to make it interesting for private business to invest in this kind of work. Uh, next, Pete, please. Our peatland program, it's uh, its led by Rachel, Rachel Coyle, largely. And this is another map that we use. We use a lot of maps, but this is the one that shows the, um, the not so much the peatland resource, but more the heather resource. The purple area is, is where the heather appears uh, in the borders from the aerial photography that's all been mapped. And one would assume that, that some of the deepest people will be under the heather. So, you know, we know where to go, obviously, to start doing a, a peatland restoration work. Next slide, Pete, please. And what we're, we're dealing with sometimes is this top left image here is, is, is an aerial of, of peat hags. You see a lot of this in the border hills, particularly in the western part of the region. You see these deep peat gullies on the top right there, and you see a lot of bare peat as well. So there's lots and lots can be done in these in these areas. We're working with, or Rachel is working with Nature Scott, Peatland Action Programme, private landowners in these areas. We're using the, the carbon funding through the carbon code to uh, verify these for uh, carbon funding payments. Next slide, please, Pete. And some of the things we can do, you could do re uh, Pete Hag reprofiling this digger on the right, uh, on the left rather, that's what he's doing, is reprofiling that particular Pete Hag. It's been eroded with sheep and, and water erosion through the years. We can, on the right there, we can block the drains using heather to, again, to re-wet the peat, get the sphagnum moss, moss forming again, keep the top of the bog nice and wet, stop the carbon being released to the atmosphere. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, conifer, uh, conifers will, if they're nearby in plantation, will self-seed on to these bogs. So it's important to try and remove the conifer as much as possible uh, to try and keep that uh, surface pretty intact as a habitat for, for peat bog plants. And if you can do that it, it, and get it wetter, then the peat bog will start to regenerate again. 
And you must remember, I suppose, that some of these peat bogs have been around for 10,000 years and they've stopped forming, but the whole idea is to try and get them forming again and developing and storing that carbon because they're really great carbon sinks. Uh, next slide, Pete. We've become very good, Tweed Form has, at mapping heather uh, and deep peat particularly, and it is quite uh, laborious work, but you just walk across the peat bog uh, probing. Uh, this is one of our, uh, our older colleagues here working uh, with the peat probes there in his hand and probing these peat bogs. And you can see with the map that's been generated, it can be one, two, three, four metres deep in peat. So these are really, really extensive uh, depths of peat that have been there a long, long time, but they produce some wonderful maps so we know exactly how deep these bogs are and, and the blanket bogs are particularly. Next slide, Pete. One of the, the early ones we did for the Peatland Code was at Dry Up Farm near St Mary's Loch. This is the top of the Dry Up Farm, the headwaters of the Dry Up Farm next to Kirkstead there. A near image. Next slide, please, Pete. And what we're mapping here is in red are the peat hag. And in blue, you can see the, the artificial or the man-made grips, the man-made drains. And the idea is to try and restore some of these hags in red and block some of these ditches in blue. And next slide, Pete. And this is the peat uh, ditch blocking map that was generated. There's about 130, 540 peat dams put in across these grips. Again, that just it doesn't just slow the flow, it just it gets the, the surface of the bog really wet and gets the sphagnum growing again, hopefully. So that's really good. It's a small scale project, but it's, you know, it's a start. We'd like to do much more of that. And uh, Rachel's busy working away in schemes at the moment. So that's good to see. Next slide, please. This is an image of a, a recently restored hag. You'd hardly recognize it, but that was a vertical face of peat uh, before this image was taken and two months later, and the chaps went in and, and reprofiled that face and, and and the heather just takes right away. So you'd hardly ever know there'd been a hag there. So it's very, very natural now looking and, and that'll just help keep the carbon uh, from, from escaping and keep the peat in place and keep the heather growing and, and the peatland growing as well. Uh, as regards what's been actually created, well, 202 hectares of upland peat bog have been restored to date through this project, 19 hectares of raised bog, we we'll followed the peatland code, we wish to explore more uh, as time goes on, so there's lots of projects queuing up to, to be getting involved with this, that's great. Next please. The challenge opportunity of this, well they're, they're slightly different, it, it's something to do with timing, the, the grants that are available to do this work are, are in, depending on the yearly uh, grant cycle, so um, we'd, we'd like it if possible to try and go over to a two year cycle, so we're not maybe doing the work at the wettest time of the year, which is the winter time, so um, that can probably be resolved in due course, but you know, it's just getting contractors out on site as well to do the work, getting the good contractors out who know what they're doing is really important too. So it's all, it's all a challenge, but it, it works really well. Next slide, please. And the fourth major project is uh, led by Emily, Emily Isles. This is our, our long-standing project. This is our Tweed Invasive project, been going now for over 18 years. It's controlling hogweed and Japanese knotweed, laterally skunk cabbage, and uh, going forward, Himalayan balsam. These are, the, these are the four key invasive plants, if you like, in the borders. Uh, next slide. And here's an image of uh, giant hogweed on the main stem of the Tweed, just above Norham. Bridge, if anybody that knows that's not in the distance. Um, this is hogweed on the left bank of the tweed there in 2007, there it is in 2020. Uh, still no sign of it coming back, so that's tremendous. It's a good monitoring program going on. Uh, next slide. And American skunk cabbage. Uh, this is this is quite an interesting plant. It can grow very, very tall. On the left here, you can see how it's, it's escaped from a garden upstream here, and it's gone downstream, working its way down the river system. Um, but if you get onto it quick enough, you can control it and uh, in 2020 there's no sign of it coming back so that's really good so these sites are well known we know where they are so we can keep on top of them uh, fairly easily next slide please and the one Emily is working on most recently is uh, is with Hemley and Balsams a lot of that in the catchment and Hemley's been working with Cabby to try and uh, work a way of, of not killing it particularly but just trying to knock it back through releasing a, a pathogen uh, uh, a rust fungus essentially that is specific to Himalayan balsam. So it, it gets released uh, last summer 
and they're going to monitor it on seven sites in the Tweed this year. So it's the first in Scotland to be done. It's been done in England, uh, but it's the first one in Scotland. So she'll be monitoring that very closely to see how the, the uh, hemolyan balsam reacts to that pathogen. You can see the spots there, the spores in there, uh, the pathogen there, try to weaken that plant to let other plants come through between the dense stands of, of hemolyan balsam. So hopefully that'll be a success. Uh, next, please. Yeah, it's long term, this project, 18 years. Securing annual funding is always a challenge. It requires a dedicated project officer like Emily, it requires paid contractors like Mike and others who come along every summer and help out. So, yeah, and it's working with the local galleys and the fishermen, the volunteers on their stretch of the river to try and deal with this and, and keep it under control. But it's really worth it. It's really doing well. Next slide, please. This is a picture from 2003 that shows the tweed catchment as it was then. The red area is where the Giant hogweed particularly was bad in 2003. It was high uh, right throughout the catchment from Berwick through Kelso up to Hoyk and up to Mellows in the Tweed. Uh, if you look at that in 2020, though, so next slide, it's uh, it's really quite uh, low. It's really rare, it's in the 1-5% bracket there. So, you know, it's been really effective in controlling hogweed. And the lads will go out in the summer and they will just, you know, they will even, you know, if we get a phone call from someone who finds a hogweed plant and anywhere in the catchment, we can go out and get a good reference for it and just treat that one plant to stop it seeding and sending its seeds downstream. So it's really a very, very good program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well that's, that's the main ones, that's the main projects. So we just like to look at some of the, the other projects and share these with you, because uh, there's quite a number of, of smaller ones like the Borders Wading Bird Project. We're worried about the, the state of our wading bird population. We've got a tree grant scheme as well, a small tree grant scheme going for landscape trees. Um, we've got the Destination Tree Programme coming on stream in its development phase now. It's a, a, almost a trail that runs from, uh, well, hopefully will run from the source of the tweed down to, to Berwick. And that's, that's you know, we're just part of that. It's it's a massive project potentially with lots and lots of partners involved here. Next slide, please. We mentioned waders. Well, yeah, we have a we are really worried about them. You can see from this distribution map of where our waders are. They're, they're essentially along the, the Lammermuir Ridge into the Moorfoots there. Um, not so many down in the southern part of the borders and down to Chivitz, but you can see where they are. They're actually along the the places where the with the grouse moors are in the heavily keepered estates are, and that would make complete sense. And it's because it's predators largely that are probably taking these ground nesting birds, but and we're trying to work with farmers to, to try and enhance the, the populations in these areas. Next slide, please, please Pete. And here's the, the bird in question, uh, the beautiful bird, the lapwing and curlew as well. They're on the decline, really serious decline. Um, so worried about it that we might well lose them, you know, in our lifetime, which is a would be a real tragedy. Next slide, please. But if we work with farmers, and lots of them are very keen to look at things like, if you know where the waders are, you can do reduced spring grazing in these fields and keep the, the cattle number and the sheep number down. You can get the chicks uh, to hatch from these eggs. So there's quite a number of farmers come on board with this particular project. Next slide. Soft trash cutting too. If you can just get this mosaic of habitat right, then the birds, carlou and lapping, will like this mosaic of tall uh, rushes and short rushes and wet grassland and dry grassland, closely cropped, slightly longer. They like this habitat mosaic, as it were. Next slide, please. And scrapes, they just love scrapes. And scrapes are so important for these little birds in the springtime when they've hatched. This is where the insects will be, and this is where the chicks make for. Uh, then the invertebrates will be in these little wetland patches and then they'll move out further afield as time goes on but they're, they're fundamental when the chicks are so small that's where the insect larvae will be for them. Next slide please. And ponds, ponds are always, as I said earlier, ponds are always popular. We, we do lots and lots of ponds uh, over the years of in dozens and dozens. These are just, I'll just run through a few examples. Unfortunately the, <laughs> these images are taken just not long after the ponds are created so they often look a bit like building sites but you know if you go back again and photograph them in the summertime they look so much better but you know they're very very effective and really important in landscapes where there aren't so many wetlands now next slide please 
yeah, just absolutely fantastic, particularly for amphibians, you know, newts and toads and frogs just absolutely love these habitats. So this is one of the sentinel borders near Selkirk, just really, really tremendous. The farmers so keen here uh, to, to do the right things for wildlife. It's great to work with farmers like that. And there's lots of them. There's lots of them that are really keen to do the right things. So that's good to see. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. We've got a tree grant scheme we mentioned. Um, the borders tree grant scheme run with us and a few other partners in, in tandem. Uh, it's really to try and look after our, our landscape trees that we're losing to ash dieback, essentially. These are oak trees here, but to try and replace ash that are dying in the countryside. Next slide, please. Uh, this is this is a, a series of ash trees that this picture was probably taken about two years ago in the Smilin to Kelso Road, really. These are mature ash trees, but I'm, I'm quite sure that if we go back in five or ten years' time, these trees may not be there. And, and they are showing signs of, of stress and strain to ash die back, especially these two big ones on the left. One on the right is not looking so bad, but the two on the left are looking as if they're suffering a little bit from uh, the virus. Next slide, please. And the aim behind this particular project is to put these landscape trees back, the parkland trees, the hedgerow trees, the copses, the roundels, the tree lines, orchards even. Um, it's been so successful that we're we're going to, with our partners, try and roll it across Dumfries and Galloway, expand it and call it the South Scotland Tree Planting Grant and work with our partners uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership, Woodland Trust, um, Scottish Forestry, the Council. We've planted over 38,000 landscape trees over the last six years in the borders alone. We think it's a unique scheme in Scotland, and um, so we're just hoping to repeat that success and plant maybe 10,000 year, 10,000 trees this year uh, from April the first across Dumfries and Galloway and borders. Next slide, please. And that'll be the area, hopefully, that we'll be able to cover now, not just the Scottish borders, but right across to Port Patrick, essentially in the west so that's going to take quite a, a challenge but our colleagues in the Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership will help help deliver that and advise the farmers there who may need some help with their with their farms that's good news uh, next slide please uh, and these are just some examples of schemes that have happened in the past there's some parkland trees on the left there's some hedgerow trees on the right there and there's a small copse uh, again bottom left so you know not big less than a quarter of a hectare but you know hugely important from a landscape perspective especially when we might be losing ash in, in these in these landscapes next slide please this is the image um, <clears throat> taken with a telephoto lens. We can see these mature trees in the middle foreground. And you can just see along these hedgerows, the younger trees that have been planted through that particular scheme a number of years ago. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to create right across the landscape. And you see there's lots of potential in the distance and these hedgerows in the distance to do that similar thing. It's put these trees back in the landscape to clip the hedge lines. Because you can imagine if that big hedge line in the top distance there and uh, if that was all ash, then you would lose that skyline of trees there. Uh, so they try and put them back, particularly things like oak and beech and sycamore. They're particularly big trees in the borders landscape. And these are wonderful trees to see. Uh, next slide, please. We've been involved in uh, with the Environment Agency last year. They came to us and wanted to get involved in a project to look at um, water quality and the, the drinking water supply for Berwick. This is the fell sandstone outcrop, if you like, and encouraging farmers not to put so much nitrogen onto that. There's not a problem, essentially, but it, before it becomes a problem, you try and get them to absorb as much of the nitrate through um, overwinter cover crops and, and not applying fertilizer in the first place. So really, that was that was an interesting one. Um, we tried a different approach with that, working with a, an online um, auction platform essentially had a budget and see if farmers would be keen to, to apply for the funding through that simple process and they were it worked it worked surprisingly well really so there's lots and lots of uh, over to cover crop went in and was lapping up some of the nitrates there hopefully uh, next slide please yep that's an example just on the left of what the cover crop looked like and obviously that's just a fertilizer spread on the right but you know it's that simple things like that but they do they are really really effective particularly winter over winter cover crops are very very good at lapping up excess nutrients in the soil and we'd like to see more of that being planted on our arable fields we do a lot of agri environment schemes uh, clearly as well um they're in a bit of a hiatus at the minute there is a scheme this year but hopefully in due course in the next two three years will be a no coal farm uh, conservation scheme if you like not just for exercise but for the whole farm and we can start putting these 
big enough to back in and start creating these habitats for wildlife and for bees and for butterflies and for birds because they're, they're absolutely essential for, for everyone living in the countryside. Next, please. Uh, Pete, is that going to move on? Nope. There we go. And then one of the last ones really is the tail restoration strategy. This is Joe, Joe Tailforth, our colleague at Tweed Forum, and he's working on the English side of the of the catchment. This is the River Till. And you can see the River Till has evolved through here. Some of these big flood events, it's broken out of its main course on the left. It's flooded across the field and creating a new course on the right there. And that's happening more and more with uh, the wet winters we're having. Next slide, please. This is the River Tell, just to get your bearings, here's Coldstream in the top left, Berwick in the top right, and that's the kind of cache we're talking about, the Glen, the Till, the Breamish down to the left. Next slide, please. Yeah, we'll just move over that one, I think. Next slide, please. Yeah, some of the problems on uh, on uh, the Wooler Water, particularly are things like Hawkhead Ford, you know, there, there are clearly problems there, trying to resolve that one uh, in due course. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I think that one speaks for itself, really. Uh, next slide, please. And avulsion, we see a lot of avulsion in that particular valley, so the river uh, Glen here. You can see these red arrows show where the river is breaking out every time there's a flood. So um, that's a natural process, clearly. But I know there's properties that are that are in danger of flooding. There's good farmlands in danger of flooding. So it's trying to work with nature, trying to work with people in the valley to do the right thing for that particular valley. Next slide, please. Is the, uh, an aerial image of the avulsion uh, back in 2008. You can see just how much gravel uh, that was brought down through that uh, river glen and was deposited in the field and ripped out the hedge through the middle there. So it was quite a traumatic event for the for the farmer involved there, I'm sure. So it's just trying to work with nature, to say, to try and resolve these these issues and try and make it right for the environment, for the people and for, for food production. Uh, next slide, please. That was an image of the, the valley before it flooded back in 2008. Just keep an eye on this uh, conifer block in the center foreground here. Next slide, please. That's the same uh, view uh, 10 years later. So the river is encouraged to do more of a natural thing down through there, but uh, you can't always do that in, in situations, but uh, try to work with nature is, is really important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and our last big project to talk about is the Destination Tweed program that Luke Fisher and Marina Piper at Tweed Forum are, are helping to lead on and hoping to deliver a, a flagship project, basically a footpath all the way down the length of the River Tweed from the source to the sea and have lots of environmental projects all the way down from footpath creation to designed landscapes, wildflower meadows, pollinating crops, um, archaeological interpretation, riparian woodlands, inns and a big environmental education program. So it's really quite exciting. There's lots and lots could happen with that program. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Next slide, please. Yeah, we think the environmental education program will be a big, big part of that, but it's it's a big partnership uh, program. There'll be five local authorities involved. It'll be orchestrated through the National Lottery Heritage Funds, Trust Trans uh, is heavily involved, South of Scotland Enterprise, Tweed Forum and our partners and various trusts and foundations. So uh, really excited about this one, really excited. And it seems to be going very well, very well at the moment. Next slide, please. And I think the last two or three slides are really about the bigger picture and where we might be going. You know, we feel that in the borders, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, in our uplands, if the uplands are going to deliver more for biodiversity and climate change, how are we going to do that? It's this, um, you know, traditional hill sheep farms look a bit like this on the left and commercial forestry looks a bit like that on the right. And, you know, can these be merged together a bit better with all the other services that these landscapes can provide? It's going to be so important to try and resolve these issues and challenges there. Next slide, please. Yeah, to get the, basically get the linkages to, to break, to connect these landscapes together, the upstream, the downstream, because there's a disconnect at the minute, definitely, between the communities living in the downstream, communities living in the upstream. And if, if a lot of the services are being provided in these upstream areas, then, you know, maybe people in the downstream areas need to pay more to the people in the upstream areas. Maybe they need to be a, a, a more of a connection there because a lot of these services can be provided to the benefit of people and wildlife and farmers in the uplands. So it's delivering the right landscape in the right place at the right scale. We feel that's really important. And the last slide really is this one. Um, it's really just to 
to leave you with a set of questions, because these are questions that we have to try and resolve and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. If we are to deal with biodiversity loss and climate change, you know, question one would be, what do landowners and rural communities want that plans to look like and be used for? Where and how do we target public finances to help achieve the desired objectives? How do we attract more private investment? And how do we encourage greater farmer cooperation? And there could be a role for the upcoming regional land use partnerships here. We would like to think so, but um, I'll leave that one with you because we don't have the answers, frankly. So um, yeah, be interested to hear what anybody has to say on that. Uh, but I think that's me for the moment. So thank you very much and your patience, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Derek. That no problem. A, a very interesting talk. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Rutherford. I'm the another committee member from Central Borders Group, and I'm going to be uh, in charge of trying to consolidate some of the questions for Derek. We've got 28 so far. Um, some of them have been grouped into certain themes, so I'm going to try and uh, ask them the questions uh, based on some of the themes so we're not repeating ourselves all the way through. So most popular questions, uh, top two, basically asking about beavers. Um, have you got any plans to reintroduce beavers? Do you know of any plans to reintroduce beavers uh, in the Borders region on the Tweed? I do, I, as far as I'm aware, there, there, there aren't any plans to reintroduce beavers at the moment. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there aren't, no. It, not to say they won't come in time, but uh, at the moment, I don't think there's a, a plan to reintroduce them. No, there isn't. Right. Okay. So, sorry, folks. You have to wait a bit longer. Uh, right. Uh, next down, most popular one, looking at which trees, um, which native trees do you use for replanting uh, the native woodland? And is this based on historical pollen records? Um, and if so, how far back in time did you uh, go? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, no, we don't base it on anything uh, historic pollen records. We just base it on what we think is going to grow well there today and what we know was probably there in the past uh, uh -huh. through, through other historic records. But we, we tend to, as I mentioned earlier, we tend to plant at least 10 species. So, you know, we'll have the open ground areas. We'll have our shrubs. Our shrubs might be 20%. percent they would be things like uh, hawthorn, blackthorn, hazel, juniper, maybe some holly. Um, our taller broad leaves might be things like oak no longer ash sadly because ash has got a, a, an issue with disease so uh, we plant more oak in that case um birch rowan uh gain, uh that kind of thing so yeah lots and lots of of diversity uh, aspen aspen alder willow particularly in the wet areas we love aspen and more the more aspen we plant the more the further west we go so we just you just can't get aspen very easily but it's a lovely tree to plant and it, it, you know it does uh Self seed really quite well, and uh, it's a really, it's a lovely tree, beautiful trees. Let's see more aspen in the borders, yeah. But a, a really good mix, a really good mix, and try to make them as diverse as possible. And need to be diverse to deal with the climate that's that's changing. You know, the more yep. diverse these mixes are, yeah, absolutely. Um, someone did ask whether or not you're planting the aspen, particularly for beavers, but uh, and <laughs> well, maybe in time, maybe in time, but <laughs> at the moment, not specifically for beavers, no. Okay. Just for just for wild, just for wildlife generally, yeah. Right. So the next ones we've got. Uh, have you been finding any skills shortages? You did mention that um, there's a, a limited number of people who do the peatland work, but yeah, you know, there's our barrier to getting. I think. Done. I think um, you know, good contractors are you know are always in high demand, so uh, we're always uh, at pains to try and get the contracts out as quick as we can to the to the contractors because you know the you know the, the, the good contractors are, are always busy. But yeah, mm. there's the, you know, we're not. You know, we don't we don't struggle to to find the contractors very often, but you know, it, it's often up against the time scale which we need to do uh, against a, a clock, which is a challenge for us. But we can usually manage to find the contractors, uh, whether it's tree planters or fencers or uh, guys working the diggers. We can usually find them. So there's there's very very skilled people out there, very good people out there. So at the moment we're we're, we're managing, uh, yep. as others are. So yeah, yeah, and and even for training for for youngsters coming into the industry and and learning about conservation, we just feel that there's going to be more and more work for them hopefully as the environment steps up the agenda so yeah i think uh, i think that would be really good uh, i'll just maybe put my video on if yeah that's good stuff it. um yeah, and yeah. next one we've got a couple of people asking about the indicators used to measure the success or how do you evaluate the impact of, of what you've done in particular say planting the woodland how do you know it yeah it's it's the, flooding? 
it's 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 a difficult one that because we're not we're not doing so much monitoring on our on our on our woodland planting. At the Edelston Water, there's a lot of monitoring going on through Chris and his and his team. So there's lots and lots of monitoring going on in that particular catchment and others uh, less so. Um, but you know, if if you plant trees, things will happen. We're sure of that. So, and and we think time is is not on our side, frankly, for a lot of these things. So we feel you do need to just bash on and and do things like plant trees and create ponds and wetlands. So. Yeah, we, we we monitor where we can, uh, but it, it's quite costly to do that. But we do feel that in the next scheme that comes along, there should be certainly a monitoring program, even if just photographic monitoring, something quick and, and relatively cheap to do. Um, but we do feel... Much nope, I think we're losing Derek there. That's a quick glance of Derek, but I think it's probably better if we ask him. To, uh, oh, right. Sorry, in my way. You again. I'll just, I'll just. Might be better to go back to no video. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay, that's no problem. I've just switched it off. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you again. Uh, so just carrying on with the, the, the enhancement. Excellent, uh, I'll just. And the, the trees. Uh, we had questions of what is the rate of loss of new trees? Do you have any um, statistics or sort of numbers of out of how many trees you plant, how many you think? Yeah, are... I think. I, th I think we can. We, we usually work on the basis of you know in a normal year. Um, last year was abnormal due to the dry spring, but you know, 10, 15, 20 percent is not is not unusual to right. lose due to whatever. Um, so we just go in and beat them up in the second and third year. So that's a standard loss rate. Some were slightly higher last year because of the droughty spring. So there'll be more beaten up probably required, you know, over the winter to beat these ones up. But yeah, I mean, that's accepted. Uh, normals, uh, 10, 15, 20 percent, yeah. Right. OK, and, and question popular one, who owns the land you're enhancing? I, you just uh, mentioned farmers, but... <laughs> well, ev ev well, everyone. Um, the bulk of what we do is with you know, farmers, landowners, estates, uh, all land is owned by someone. Uh -huh. um, so uh, big estates like, you know, Buclu or, or Floors, Roxburgh, Lothian, um, Williams and March, we work with these big land. We work with tenant, we, we work a lot with tenant farmers. You'd be surprised how many tenant farmers we work with, you know, and it's not easy for the tenant farmers, uh, especially putting in things like woodlands, because they don't necessarily have long term security there, but they're very, very keen to do agri environment schemes, very, very keen to do woodland planting. So you'd be really quite surprised how many tenants we do work with. So it's a good mixed bag, frankly. It's a good mixed bag. Right. Okay, and just carrying on with the, the riparian strip at the moment, I want to view what um, in Africa, no farm. Sorry, Mike, I'm losing you there. Can be done next to rivers. I, I missed that question completely, Mike. Sorry, I keep losing my broadband. Sorry. Could so you just, just ask that? Sorry. Any regulations or rules about what can be done um, close to a river? You know, are farmers allowed to farm within 30 meters of a river? You know, basically affecting the, the riparian strip. Yeah, there are, there are, you know, six meters is as general uh, considered width. But and if you're putting a woodland in, for example, a woodland would need to be 15 meters wide. You again. Uh, you, if you're putting in a woodland, for example, the woodland yep. would need to be 15 meters wide uh, through the, the Scottish forestry criteria. So you need to have a buffer at least 15 meters to put your woodland in. I think it goes slightly closer with, with arable fields, but they are buffered, they are protected. You've got to come in, you find the top of the bank, come in two, three meters from the top of the bank and start plowing. So these rules have, in, have improved a lot over recent years. So there are very, very strict guidelines about working within close proximity to water courses, both from a plowing perspective and from a, a planting perspective. Right, excellent. Okay, uh, and just one more, just carrying on with that. How do you decide where the re 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 meandered section of river will go? Yeah, I, th I think it's the low-hanging fruit, uh, Mike. It's 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 finding landowners that are that are keen, you know, and picking sites that are maybe not so valuable to begin right. with. So land that is maybe of a lesser value, but the landowners and farmers are really keen to do something uh, for the environment. So it's it's a low-hanging fruit always, you know. We, we appreciate you could never do it on the on the most valuable land in the most highly productive floodplains. That would never happen. But yeah. you know, in the hill landscapes, there is there is suitable sites definitely. Okay, um, so just moving on from the rivers for a moment. Uh, where there is open bog, would you, would you prefer to keep these as they are, or would you promote bog woodland? There's been a couple of questions. Yeah, that's an, <laughs> that's an interesting one. The consensus is to, is, is to try and keep them as, 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 as open bog, 
Um, if they're wet, try and get them wetter. If they're dry, try and get them wetter. Um, try and remove Sitka spruce if it's regenerating onto the bog. Um, but bogs that have, you know, natural lags around the edge of native woodland, that's, you know, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. So even if they're reseeding onto the bog of, of native trees, it's not so bad as reseeding of Sitka spruce, for example. So, yeah, bogs, bogs is probably a, a, a habitat that will, will maybe change your attitude over time. At the minute, it's keep them open and free. But you can maybe see in time that that might ease up just a bit, you know, that they might accept more tree natural generation on them. I don't know with the carbon, with the carbon storage, etc. Yeah. Okay. Just carrying on with the uh, upland um, bogs and muirs. Is there anything being done to stop much stopping damaging muir burn in the uplands? Are you involved in that in any way? Well, not not so much. It, it is still an option within um, SRDP schemes. You can still apply for burning. And, and you would think in this day and age, maybe, maybe that is time limited now. You just, you know, you just wonder whether flailing or swiping would be, would be better for the environment than, than burning heather, frankly. So you can see that maybe being reduced in, in time uh, and a more natural process taken. But, you know, if you want, heather moorland is on a natural landscape at, at the end of it, oh. end of the day, it's a, it's a man-made landscape very often. And so you've got to decide, society or the landowners have to decide what it is that they want from that landscape. And that's all part of the thing we're discussing tonight. What do you want these landscapes to look like? What services do you want them to provide? You know, what, you know that's all really important. If you want Heather Moorland, you have to be up front and say, we want Heather Moorland for, for Heather's sake. If we don't want Heather Moorland, then we don't want Heather Moorland. But I think we have to be honest about why we want it and, and where, it, where it is. Uh -huh. you know? mm -hmm. Okay, and just carrying on with the Moorland, there's one. Um, when working on peatland, Merland, do you change the grazing strategy when trying to manage the hags? Have you, you, know, you advise on that? Yeah, we, we do. We do advise on that, Mike. I think um, if looking at dry up at that particular site of dry up that we gave an example of, the, uh, the sheep had been off that top heft for probably the best part of 15, 16 years. So there weren't any sheep on it. And when the sheep were coming back on, you know, they were coming back on a much, much lower density than they ever had been. So they're, they're, they're lightly grazed they're not they're not heavily grazed at all, these sites. Um, and clearly, if you're making them wetter, you probably wouldn't want them to be heavily grazed. You'd want them to be more lightly grazed and certainly not burned. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, right, let's move on to the sort of invasive species. We've got a few mm -hmm. questions related to that. Um, one, a couple of ones about actual plants. What do you treat the hogweed, hogweed with, please? Uh, Roundup. Roundup, just Roundup, okay. Roundup, yeah. And right, there's another one asking again about the, uh, what was technique was successful to eradicate American skunk cabbage? And now you'd have to speak to my colleague. I think that would be Emily that would be dealing with that. And I, I could be wrong. I think that, no, I could be wrong. It could be round up, but I'm not sure uh, right. how she treated the, I think it would just be stem injection, but I'm not sure. It's usually round up that we use, to be honest, on all these plants, uh, glyphosate. Okay, chemical treatments, basically. Yeah, chem yeah, chemical, yeah, physical treatment is just, it's just too much, you know, yeah. to do. It, it has to be chemical at the moment, and glyphosate is the one that, that deals with it. And it's pretty benign near water, to be honest, so... It's not a, we don't feel it's a major problem and it's, it's the only one at our disposal, frankly. Uh, right. But that's why, that's why she's brought in the, um, the rust fungus to try and control yep. the Himalayan balsam, to try and do it in a more biological way, in a natural way. Yeah. Uh, and just carrying on with you, you mentioned four of the main species invasives, but uh, someone's asking, could you attempt to control a few flowered garlic in the future? It has been talked about, but again, that is... That is just everywhere. It just seems to be everywhere. And it's just economies of scale and trying to deal with that. We, we feel that the, the priority ones are, are the bigger ones, but we, we do sympathize that that, that, that garlic is a, is a problem. It is really so. But it's just how do you do it? it? It just seems to be rife in our cliques and woodlands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So moving on from the plants to some of the, the uh, freshwater animals. Very little mention of fish in this, but the salmon is an indicator species in this ecology. So mm. you are very interested in the health of migratory fish throughout the catchment. Uh, yeah, asking. absolutely. We work, we work very closely with the Tweed Foundation and, and that's their remit to look after the fish really and, and yep. have a close relationship with them. So yeah, we, we, we do all the work that we do, all of it by and large will benefit the river. We're pretty sure of that. And then by definition, will benefit the fish. So but specifically talking about the fish, you know, if we can get the, the, the riparian zone 
better managed, as it were, with overhanging trees, in part, you know, shading for the fish. We talked about the river temperatures being the biggest worry. The Foundation are very aware of that. The river temperatures are increasing due to global warming, so that's desperately bad for the fish. So, yeah, we, we'd, we'd plan to work with them to look at putting uh, trees, uh, shading trees down these watercourses as much as possible. And then keeping cattle out the river, keeping sheep out the river, lots of fencing work going on for streamside fencing. So it, it all just benefits the riparian zone that we that we like to manage and call it. Yeah. So I think you answered a few extra questions there as well. Uh, people were asking about temperature increases, climate change, so that's good. Uh, right. Um, I'm just asking about just carrying on with the animals. Any what's the situation with introduced signal crayfish? Have you come across those in your not not so not so many and I mean they are there but there's not so many that we we haven't done much with the, the, the crayfish to be honest um, right. at all. But they are they are in part there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the water temperatures are increasing so you get to that. Uh, where are we at next now? Um, how quick do new ponds colonize with with species, you know, have you sort of done any monitoring? Well, we, again, we, we haven't, Mike, it's a very good question. We haven't done any monitoring on, on our ponds, but um, the only monitoring is kind of visual or photographic. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing how wildlife comes back. We, we don't introduce plants to any of the ponds that we've ever done over the years. It just They just seem to colonize really, really quickly with uh -huh. plants, particularly. In fact, the danger is too many plants seem to find a way in them. They can be clogged up with reed mace or, you know, bulrush or something like that. But, you know, wildlife just finds it, you know, that, that old adage, you know, create it and they will come and they do. Yeah. You know, they just come from nowhere. The wildlife is just fantastic. So, no, we don't need to do Flying that. insects and birds. Everything. They just, they just find it. They, could, they find it almost, yeah, the digger drivers are there. They just, they just, they're there, you know, they just arrive. And ducks as well. It's, they're just great. National uh -huh. colonizers, yeah. And certainly the frogs and toads and other amphibians don't take long to. They just, they just, they just find them, don't they? Just, they're just straight yeah. in there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, just carrying on. Uh, other difficulties accessing land for non-native species controls, where landers, with, landowners are either unwilling to cooperate or can't be traced. Are there any issues like that? Yeah, I think, I think there's always. I mean, Emily is, leads on this, and I think she has over the years. Um, she does very, very well. To engage with a lot of people. Uh, landowners there's a one or two that are maybe more difficult to, to reach as it were but uh, by and large no we've got we've just got a really great hit rate on it and getting everybody work together it's really very very good so uh -huh. we've, got no, we've got no complaints there sometimes land ownership is, is is more of an issue just who owns little bits of land parcels of land right. that's maybe not always so clear you know yeah um so we, we work hard to resolve these and get to know who owns all the little stretches of their water course yeah. yes some private estates there is grouse shooting there's all of these Big farms, little farms, but then just random patches. That yeah, yeah, can't just quite trace. Can't yeah. quite, can't quite trace exactly. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, where are we at? Um, another popular one. How much do you work with trees for life? Do you work with trees for life? Uh, not not so much. No, we haven't. No, not so much. We we do work with a lot of partners, but not so much with trees for life. No, right. okay. we haven't. No, we, we should. I, we should. I, There's no reason why we shouldn't, but we should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just sort of the general one, um, carrying on from the question about sort of working with landowners, uh, you know, how do you show farmers, et cetera, that uh, they, what's the thing here, there's not what they want, but what the land and nature and wildlife need. Um, and carrying on from that are, are more skeptical conservative farmers coming on board. You know, how, how are you coping with the kind of the, the education and outreach part? Do you do much of that? Uh, we, we have done quite a bit of, of that in the past and we'd like to do more. Certainly through Destination Trade, we will be doing more of that, hopefully. Um, it's, it's funding our time to do it, which yeah. is a challenge. But, um, you know, we, we, we're always pushing on open door in many ways because farmers do come to us and, and ask for our help. So in that sense, we're pushing on open door. Sometimes we have projects that we do cold call farmers and we have to pick up the phone or email them and, and uh, get them on board that way. But they're always willing. You know, we're, we're very, very rarely... Uh, turned away very rarely turned away uh -huh. so you know they will give us a hearing and we can we can start the, the conversation going and it usually leads to good places so no we've got no complaints in that department whatsoever it's it's always been a very very fruitful relationship between and I'm assuming the more you do the more word of mouth amongst farmers spreads and abs know, they... abs absolutely absolutely Absolutely. And usually it's farmers themselves just watching their neighbours, you know, yeah. uh, you know, farmers will, are, are big <laughs> watching what their neighbours are doing. So, yeah, they, they see things happening and then they, they just they get a phone call from their neighbour saying, could you come and help us with that too? So, yeah, it just it's a slow drip feed system, but, it, it, you know, we, we're really busy and we, you know, we just 
steadily busy is, is what we are. So that's, it just works. It just works, you know. Uh, and just going on, we've got a few questions about the economic side of things. So we've got someone, what's the cost per hectare for restoring riparian woodlands? Uh, you know, and how much of that? Well, is yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, how long is a piece of string? It's, it depends yeah. on the site, really. Right. Uh, if, I could, I could give you a figure of, you know, Six thousand pound a hectare on average, right. something like right. that. To, to to plant a hectare of native woodland, if time you take in the fencing, the trees, the labour, six thousand pounds somewhere about that. But you know, it can be more than that. If it's a long thin strip of woodland, it'll be more than that. If it's a, if it's if it's a, a good sized block, it'll be less. Um, if it's if it's rough terrain, it'll be more. If it's if it's flat terrain, it'll be less. So yeah, I think an average figure would be about six thousand, six and a half thousand pounds per right. hectare. And so just uh, going on from there, what what are, what's your annual kind of budget costs you know how much does the tweet forum generate bring in spend yeah uh, again i don't i don't do much of the finances of the, of the organization uh, it's probably on our website to be honest but um i think yeah you know there's 10 staff to look after so it's 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 a it's a it's becoming costly, but we manage. Uh, look, our director does really, really well to keep us all uh, in, in, in work, as it were. So we're, we're deeply indebted to him and, and, and the trustees, indeed, and our partners. So I don't think, you know, financially, we're, we're doing fine. Uh, we're doing all right. Uh, but it is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. It is a challenge, uh, and especially in the current climate. But we've got to we've got to pull our resources from wherever we can get it, and we've got lots and lots and lots of different funding streams that we can tap on. So uh -huh. uh, it's, 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 there's, no, there's no magic bullet here. It's just accessing the funding where you can get it but our partners have been really really generous in, in getting funds to us to facilitate the work that we do yeah. i'm sure so the more that you do the more you show the benefits then hopefully more funding comes on board or... yeah well yeah exactly it, it, tends to, more evidence, it, it can't it, it can work. I mean, the council's been tremendous with us, you know, absolutely tremendous. So Andy Tharm at the council has been great at getting funding to us through Wind Farm Mitigation Funds. It's been a mainstay. Forest Carbon through uh, partnership with them as well. So, you know, it's just making the books balance for the projects that we've got on the books. It's just trying to find a shortfall between the grants very often and the actual cost of doing it. It's that, it's that gap. If we can find a gap to get it to cost neutral, it's such an important thing. So, yeah. The funders are there to help usually. Okay, just a couple more questions. We'll sort of finish up. Um, one, I don't know, why Sycamore? Um, I guess someone's just asking sort of why. why Sycamore. <laughs> well, I think that'd be in reference. Was that was that, was that in reference to the landscape trees? I think so. Um, we, we don't plant. Yeah, we don't we don't plant sycamore in our native woodlands at all. Uh, right. But we we're big we're big fans of them in as, as landscape trees. Right. The, the trees that do grow the trees that do grow well in the borders uh, are sycamore, oak. Beech and ash, or it was ash, they've got died back now. But these, if you travel anywhere, particularly in Berwickshire, Roxburghshire, as isolated trees in, in the farm landscapes, that's what you'll see. You'll see ash, oak, beech, and sycamore. They grow really well, and they're tremendous right. landscape trees. And they're tremendous yeah. trees for cutting the long lived trees, sycamore. They cast a lot of shade for, for, the, for the livestock in the fields. You know, when, when, as a parkland tree, they're, they're outstanding and, and have a lot of insects associated with them. One of the highest trees, actually, is sycamore. We always imagine it's oak, but sycamore is very high for for holding insects. So we right. we we wouldn't put it in our woodlands, but we'd put it in our in our in our landscape trees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, and going sort of back to the the, the works and uh, staffing, I, there's a scope for promoting apprentice schemes to increase the, the skilled we'd, workforce for these these projects. We'd we'd like to, and if there if there was one, that we would we would probably jump at it. You know, it's it's like when you're busy, you know, take youngsters on and is, is 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 really important to us and we have tried over the years to do that but it's it's just it's quite time consuming on, on our part but if there was an apprenticeship scheme i'm sure luke would uh, our director would look at that very very seriously uh, and, and welcome it with open arms and we would be delighted to take youngsters on and and, and try and train them up we'd, we'd just love that challenge yeah and, deal with and it. i guess it comes Absolutely down to a lot of the contractors you work with and you know if they'd be willing and able to sort of take on yeah yeah, uh, absolutely. There's, there's so much going for that approach. We think a young apprenticeship scheme for the environmental learning, if you like, in, in this in this uh, field would be would be really important. We yeah, think. there's I think a lot of talk of this possible ideas of a green new deal to take the American yeah. term, but for you know coming out of COVID and looking at ways to increase employment is, is a lot of 
wishful, hopeful thinking. Hopefully, yeah, well, hopefully, I think, yeah, let's let's think yeah. it'll come to. Let's hope it comes to fruition. Yeah, it'd be yeah. really good. We really would be delighted to do that. Absolutely delighted. Okay. Yeah. Hey, and just uh, uh, keep on asking more questions. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, next one. Are you working with landowners to protect, improve drinking water quality, uh, where there are private water supplies? Is there anything to? Um, we well, yes, um, a lot of it is, is, is riverine what we do, but you know there are a number of drinking water supplies in in the borders, uh, Scottish water. Yeah, we have we have worked with a little with Scottish water to try and uh, encourage them to do more, shall we say? So, yeah, there's there's definitely scope to do more in these in these catchments, certainly with regard to tree planting and ditch blocking and things like that. So there's there's scope to do more work in drinking water catchments, certainly. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. And just as a result of the uh, your NFM, has there been a noticeable effect on low river flows in the main river stem? Have you, have you been able to quantify river flows? Um, I think the answer to that is probably uh, it's early days. Yeah. Uh, in, in truth, you know, these these things will take time and they'll take economies of scale. And it's a start what we're doing and others uh, that are doing it as well. But you will need a central critical mass of these things, you know, wetlands, ponds, leaky barriers, woodlands, ditch blocking before you get a real impact. I mean, what we're doing will, will benefit everything we think, you know, benefit conservation of benefit NFM. Uh, the level to which it will benefit NFM will depend largely on the economies of scale that, that, of these departments, of these woodlands that go in and wetlands that go in. Um, so yeah, it, it, it very much depends on that. It will never ever, you know, nothing's going to stop these big floods, these big rainfall events. What it'll do is it'll stop the, the lower uh, events, you know, the 5, 10, 15, 20 year flood events it, it'll never stop the 100 year flood no. events and we're getting more we're yeah. getting more of these nothing's going to stop them frankly so but you know the, the the lesser flood events it will definitely have an impact on them so the more we can do and the more farmers work together at scale the less of an impact there will be from these big flood events we'll be better placed and more resilient to deal with them right okay let's see if we can finish off some of these last few ones quickly if we see himalayan balsam growing on a local walk should we report it, and if so, to whom? Uh, probably not. Probably not the Himalayan balsam, please. But the uh, giant hogweed, yep. uh, Japanese knotweed, uh, American skunk cabbage, but not the balsam. The balsam is so prolific that we're, we, you know, we're spray out <laughs> But certainly, giant hogweed, uh, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam. Just please uh, go on the website, Tweed Form website, and just drop us an email uh, and with a grid reference, and, and we'll try and we'll try and uh, get Mike out. And, and you've got a dedicated page that. on your your Tweed Form website for. Well, just, just if, if, if you just, yeah, there is, if you just drop us out, just there's, there's an ends page there so you, they can find all about the species to look for, but just right. drop us an email at info.tweetforum.org and, and we'll, we'll pick that up and we, when if, if there's a good reference or a phone number, we can phone them back. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, how much will the new agri-environment schemes contribute to this process? I'm not sure if anyone else is a two-parter from Frank Moby, sorry. Uh, can't quite understand. Yeah. How much do the new agri-environment schemes contribute to the process and will they give the necessary long-term funding? Uh, do you know anything about sort of the... Um... Uh, well, we, we, we don't actually, Mike. At the minute, we're still waiting for, right. for, for the new scheme, you know, post-Brexit. Um, there will be a new scheme. Uh, the old schemes were, were, were good, but they probably didn't really go far enough. You know, there was, there was a lot of demand on them and, you know, they were good. But I think going forward, they will have to be more targeted at certain areas uh, of the catchment to really start right. delivering at the catchment scale so yeah let's bring them on bring them on as soon as we possibly can yep. and get, get the farmers working together at scale we start targeting start targeting where these priorities are, are really needed and, and just uh coming another one from frank, frank asking about worrying about uh how much water is held in the dammed upland drains um, and the potential risk of bog slides is, is this uh, an issue um that, that not not with our not within the schemes that we have actually done we're, we're not aware of any bog slides that have happened but we have seen images of bog slides on the internet and they look fairly scary uh -huh. um, i wouldn't say they couldn't happen but uh you know we're pretty careful when we, yep. when we store these sites that they're that that won't happen so we're pretty confident it won't on the sites that we've been restoring frankly but i'm aware of what what the dangers are of bog slides and they they are quite scary but no i'm pretty confident the ones that right. we're dealing with well there will be no issue with bog slides uh, and just one final one um uh, is carbon money not slightly dirty money i think chris getting here at so large companies justifying pollution potentially doing greenwashing uh, and some of the partners or some of the funding that's mm -hmm. um 
you know, involved in what you're doing? Have, have you? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think my colleague uh, Hughes done a, a lot of schemes with with Forest Carbon, um, over the years, and they've been very, very well received by both parties, so and the farmers themselves. So I think, by and large, you know, we have to look at carbon money as a way of funding these. We have to look at, you know, forest carbon. We have to look at peatland carbon. Look, look at natural capital in its widest sense, because if we don't start looking at, at this approach, you know, how are we ever going to fund? What needs to happen in the countryside and carbon is yeah. the one at the moment. Um, peatland carbon, forest carbon, but then natural capital. And how do you put how do you put a value in a wild flower meadow? How do you put a value in a waterside margin? How do you put a value in a you know? It's all these things, but we have to somehow do that and, and create yeah. a market for, and create a market for it. Because without a market, how are you going to get the money to invest in these upland landscapes? Keep people living and working in the countryside. How do you keep people living in the countryside if they're, you know, they need to have need to have jobs for them to do? So, you know, land management should be all about managing these these habitats in its way, the sense, you know, not just having sheep and cattle and trees, but having all these other habitats there that have yeah. these services that are flowing down river to, to the towns. And and but these have to be funded. You know, the yeah. money money controls everything. And so it, that, it is important point. So ecosystem services. Yeah. Absolutely. How much money a, a, a forest, a river provides to the, sort of the, the environment around it exactly but putting a money value on it does then make it a realistic um factor in sort of economics and politics i know we'd, 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 we'd love to not talk about money but I, you know there's just no way around it the, no. you know the, the, it, money is a, is the is the lowest yeah. common denominator we have to talk money otherwise it just will not happen frankly right yeah. okay well let, let lend on i'll come down <laughs> to the money note end on that but thank you so much, Derek. You did a wonderful job there of the presentation and also fielding all those questions. There's close to 30 or more questions. Um, I hope uh, everyone was satisfied with your, your wonderful answers. Um, and I just want to say as well, thanks to the uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust HQ for hosting the webinar uh, and for dealing with our, all our technical issues to begin with. I, I just say sorry as well that um, your, your bandwidth didn't allow you to be, as I say, um, for everyone to see you doing your talk. Uh, so you'll just have to do some more talks in live in the future. When the, when the <laughs> uh, no I'm problem. Awesome Mike, thank you. For, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Cool. Okay. Right. Uh, and I think, uh, unless anyone's got anything else to say, I'm, I'll just uh, say thank you all for attending. Uh, it was a good, almost 180 people viewing at the top point, which was a, a lovely turnout. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And I, you can also pass on to your friends and anyone who missed it, that this will be uh, hosted on the Scottish Wildlife Trust website uh, to view later. Okay, well, thank you all very much and good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay there. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Bye, Mike. Thank you. I think we've got lots of nice comments there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is that just us left now? Uh, I think people are still watching. No, no, we still have participants. <laughs> I shall see if uh, Nick and Peter there. Yeah, I think I'll I'll close the meeting now, Mike oh, and yep. Alison. Thanks very much for your help and uh, you. speak again soon. Yeah, thanks, thanks very, very much. much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Good job, folks. Good night.